chapter 16 continue. Our visitor turned out to be none other than Inspector Hiram Bart, carrying a large satchel stuffed with an assortment of items. He had an expression upon his face which indicated he had come to discuss something very official. Amelia blanched when she saw him. Dear God, is it Stephen? She demanded, giving voice to the concerns which were running through all of our minds. Hiram was quick to put us all at ease in that regard. <clears throat> Stephen is much the same as you left him this morning, Hiram assured her. I am actually here on police business to discuss the case, since Stephen has become a victim of our canine attacker. Charles rubbed the short growth of stubble on his face and said, I do not know how much help I will be, since I have yet to complete all of my clinical training, but I will do my best to assist in whatever way I can. Hiram's face colored with embarrassment as he stood there searching for the right words to say. I mean no disrespect to you, Charles, he said, and this is extremely awkward for me to say, but I actually came to consult with Sir Happy and Mr. Mommy. <laughs> Charles was extremely taken aback. Surely you cannot be serious. Indeed I am, sir, was Hiram's reply. But please, allow me to explain before you take offense. Charles led Hiram into the drawing room, where we all followed closely behind them. Again, the inspector's face colored. This is very hard to explain in a way which does not make me sound like a lunatic. But I ask for your patience as I attempt to clarify my position to you all. I will begin by offering you the detailed events which led to my being here last night when we received the news of Stephen's attack. As you are all well aware, I have sought the professional help of Dr. Hanover on several occasions within recent weeks in an attempt to identify the canine responsible for the attacks. His insights were most helpful, but I still was far from closing the case. Two days ago, I received a letter from him indicating he had important information which would lead me directly to the killer. He said the particulars would need to be given in person, and he directed me to meet him here yesterday evening. The fact Stephen has now become a victim means the killer knew, or at least suspected the doctor had identified him, making it imperative I find the person responsible before word gets out he is alive. Charles' brow was knit into a very tight frown. I understand all of what you said, but frankly, I am... I understand your work. I am lost as to how Sir Happy and Mr. Marmy could help in all of this. Well, <clears throat> said Hiram, clearing his throat. I was getting to that part, you see. I believe Sir Happy and Mr. Marmy have been conducting their own investigation of sorts. And it is my hope to consolidate our efforts and find this fiend before it is too late. His words poured out in such a fast torrent, I almost missed their message, and I believe it was the inspector's intent. You're mad, blurted out Charles. Amelia choked on a cup of tea she had been nursing since the moment we entered the room, spilling its contents on the carpet. I knew you would think so, but please hear me out before you send me to the asylum, Hiram said. Have you ever noticed how interested Sir Happy and Mr. Marmy have been in the case files whenever I've brought them for Stephen's review? Both Amelia and Charles nodded in agreement. Ever since the day when Stephen asked Sir Happy's opinion on what the breed might be in relation to these attacks, I have watched him. Sir Happy, I mean, 
At first it was out of curiosity, but it very quickly transformed into amazement as I witnessed time and time again these two four-legged creatures flipping through the pages of the files. I mean to tell you they went from page to page reading the files, just like a person would. I have even seen one or the other point with their paw on the page as if drawing the other's attention to something interesting. Both Amelia and Charles looked at each other, dumbstruck by what Iram had just said, although there was nothing illogical with what he was saying from my perspective, I knew it had to sound preposterous from theirs. I was rather surprised to hear Amelia almost whisper, I have seen them do the same thing. And I was even more astounded when Charles chimed in with, so have I. Amelia immediately broke out into a recital of every time she saw us nosing through a book or newspaper, which was a daily ritual for both Sir Happy and me. I hate to admit this, but I thought they were playing with them. Since they always seemed to do it with such great care, I let them alone. I would only fuss if I was trying to clean, or if we were expecting guests. I never thought anything about it, but I did look more as though they were reading the contents as opposed to just turning the pages with their noses. Charles took this opportunity to add his own observations. I've seen Sir Happy flap flipping through my biology and chemical science books on numerous occasions, much the way I do when I'm studying or trying to reference some point or another which I could not remember on my own. As each one confessed the things they had witnessed but quickly dismissed as being improbable, Sir Happy and I very quickly found ourselves the center of their unwavering and amazed gazes. It was a little unnerving, to be honest, but based on the things which they were just beginning to realize, I could understand how they felt. Hiram continued in his journey toward understanding. Last night, when Mr. Mommy barged in and began acting in a manner which was unlike his usual cordial self, even going so far as to swipe at Amelia when she would not stop fussing over him, I wondered if he was trying to tell us something. When the officer showed up at the door and told us of the tragedy, I knew he had been trying to tell us about Stephen. He then very promptly led the way ahead of the officer. Then when I asked him if he had, if, <clears throat> and then when I asked him if had been his intention to inform us of the attack, he, both Charles and Amelia were transfixed by his words, anxious to discover something new and amazing about the two creatures with which they had been sharing their home. Hiram swallowed hard as he continued. He said yes. Charles' mouth positively fell open. You mean to say he spoke to you? Hiram rubbed his forehead, obviously stressed by this entire exchange. Not in so many words, but he answered in the affirmative to a direct question. I believe Stephen was right when he said these creatures are telling us things all of the time, things which we are unable or unwilling to understand. Amelia interrupted to say, I have always addressed them as though they could understand me, feeling so many times as though they comprehended what I was saying. I mean, I have talked with them before in much the same way as I talked to Charles or Stephen or you, Hiram. Just the other day when we came from the hospital, Charles updated both of them on Stephen's condition as though they could understand every word he said. They responded as if they understood. I just never put it all together. I feel positively ashamed of myself. Amelia launched herself upon me and scooped me up from the cushion upon which I was laying. Can you ever forgive me, Mr. Marmy, for so underestimating you that I was blind to how extraordinary you really are? 
hoping she would release me from the crushing bear hug, I rubbed my whiskers against Amelia's cheek to indicate I felt no ill will. This made her squeeze me even tighter as she exclaimed, Did you see that? He forgave me. Much to my relief, she let go of me and leaped toward the kitchen, yelling, I shall make something extra special for you all to eat. She disappeared into the kitchen and was neither seen nor heard from again for a full half hour, leaving Charles to deal with his own revelations without her. Charles sat there for a moment watching Sir Happy, who sat motionless before him with a fixed and even gaze. Occasionally, Charles look, would look in my direction, but for the most part his focus was upon the dog before him. I knew it was time for Charles to make a decision about whether or not he would believe the evidence of his experiences and acknowledge completely and with his whole heart that Sir Happy and I were capable of complex cognitive ability and reason. I would imagine he was searching through his catalog of memories, analyzing every circumstance and encounter which had seemed at the time unusually coherent, even reasoned. Very slowly, Charles reached forward and scooped Sir Happy up from the floor. He stroked the hairs between my friend's ears as he looked deeply into eyes filled with intelligence and understanding. An expression of utter amazement went across Charles's face as he said to Sir Happy, <clears throat> Stephen has always told me you are a remarkable dog but I never really knew what he meant until just now. Can you forgive a young fool? Sir Happy, in perfect form, licked Charles on the end of the nose, both in acknowledgement of his error and in forgiveness of his initial limited understanding. But now was not the time for deep emotionalism. There was a case to solve, and Sir Happy indicated his desire to change modes by bounding from Charles's arm and barking his demand to move on. Charles laughed and said, I believe it is my signal to stop the apologies and allow the discussion to shift back to the investigation. If you don't mind, however, I would like to observe the proceedings. I have a feeling there's much to be learned here. Charles dragged a beautiful inlaid table over from the side of the room, allowing Hiram to spread the contents from his satchel upon it. It was an odd assortment of mismatched items, which, in my mind, had little to do with our current investigation. There was a bloody handkerchief, a shattered wooden cane, a small leather belt with a broken buckle, along with a few other odds and ends, which might easily have been taken from a man's pocket, as from a crime scene. As Hiram placed the items on the table, Sir Happy jumped by his side to more closely view each item as it was removed from the bag. I felt as though I was witnessing a miracle. Just a short while ago, Hiram looked upon Sir Happy and myself as mere creatures of the world, with little more to offer mankind than momentary entertainment, and perhaps a bit of comfort in the evening. Last or more appropriately, <clears throat> last evening transformed his heart so monumentally, he looked to us, or more appropriately to Sir Happy, as more of an equal, capable of aiding him in an investigation which was beyond his capability to solve alone. He had so humbled himself for our sakes, he risked the potential criticism and ridicule of two people whom he deeply respected and admired. This transformation of Hiram's world would become the building block of a working partnership which would last the rest of our lives. As for Charles and Amelia, who had always exhibited a deep respect for Sir Happy and me, their new understanding in regards to all creatures would remain forever broadened, lending a greater level of respect and compassion to hearts which had always been open and accepting of all creatures, great and small. Our bonds with each other strengthened, and from that moment forward, we were never fussed at for looking through a book or perusing a paper. In fact, Amelia became most accommodating in my pursuit of the written word. Many times she has helped me peruse the contents of a bookcase, especially the shelves which were beyond my reach.
whatever book my pa would rest upon. She would pull from the shelf and carry it over to my favorite corner in the front parlor so I might read in comfort. Once she even scolded Charles for returning a volume back to the shelf before I was done with it. It is not that the Hursts dismissed Sir Happy and me as being without value or even feeling, for they had always spoken to us as they would another person, and had been considerate of our feelings and our needs, as was evidenced when Charles explained to us about Stephen's condition. It was simply the fact they could not comprehend the true complexity of our natures because we did not communicate in the same way they did with each other. Our language was foreign to them, which made it harder for them to understand the many things which we longed to communicate. Although they still had difficulty at times comprehending every detail of what we were trying to express, Amelia and Charles sought to listen more closely, believing Sir Happy and I had something to say beyond the simplistic expressions of need for food and affection. Here we are said Hiram, once he had emptied his satchel. These are all of the items retrieved from the crime scene, which I thought might pertain to the case. I excluded nothing from my observation and subsequent collection, feeling it would be better to gather too much unrelated evidence than to miss a potential clue which might have helped us identify our perpetrator. All of these things were gathered from the surrounding scene, with the exception of the handkerchief, which was taken from Stephen's person at the hospital. Apparently, he had used a handkerchief to tie off his arm immediately following the attack, but we shall get to it shortly. I thought we might go item by item, beginning with the things most questionable in their relation to the case, and ending with the ones which are most significant and most directly related to the attack, if it is acceptable. Sir Happy barked his approval, sitting alert and ready to begin. The first article for Sir Happy's review was a bit of torn paper, quite innocuous at first glance, especially when one considered it had been plucked from the ground of a busy thoroughfare but I still had much to learn in the art of investigation, for there is always much more to things than meets the eye. My friend spent some time sniffing the paper, and much to the dismay of everyone present, even went so far as to tear a piece off and munch upon it. I saw a look of doubt go across Charles's face as he cut his eyes at Hiram. The inspector barely flinched at the destructive act, perhaps hoping there was a purpose to destroying a potential evidence. I myself was a bit concerned because I knew sometimes Sir Happy took a fancy to the sound of shredding paper and would, upon occasion, tear to bits an old newspaper just to hear the music which came with the hapless paper's destruction. I also was aware as was common to the dachshund breed, my friend could be seized by fits of playfulness, which tended to come at the most inopportune times, and I said a silent prayer that now was not one of those moments. <clears throat> I knew it, he finally exclaimed, exclaimed. Mommy, come here and take a look at this. I was relieved to hear a tone in his voice which proclaimed his unwavering seriousness in the current situation. Upon jumping up beside him, he commanded me to smell the paper he had just been gnawing upon. Tell me if you detect anything, he said as I leaned toward the paper gob. You mean, aside from your spit? I asked, half jesting and half in earnest. Be serious, mommy and tell me what you notice, he replied. I did, as I was instructed, knowing my colleague was testing my skills of perception. There was definitely something to be found with this paper, and my friend was giving me the chance to display my abilities, or at least to broaden them. I breathed deeply, ignoring everything else but the hidden layers of aroma which wafted from the newly moistened scrap. Distinguishing odors is a skill which must be applied on a continuous basis to keep the proficiency in top 
form, although it was a skill which I was just beginning to cultivate, I was a fast study under the direction of my expert friend, Sir Happy. He had taught me to appreciate every odor, whether it was pleasant or otherwise, as one might appreciate the bouquet of a fine wine or the delicate flavors of a tasty meal. I savored each inhalation, thus allowing the subtleties of smells to linger and be identified by my somewhat keen olfactory senses. Sir Happy had also taught me by opening my mouth during this delicate process, I would almost taste the individual smells, making it easier to separate each odor in turn. Before I knew it, several minutes had passed, and upon looking up from my efforts, I found all eyes fixed upon me. Well, Sir Happy said, anxiously entreating me to share my results. It smells of tobacco, I began, but of a finer quality than one might find at a general tobacco store. It smells very much like the Chinese brand Lord Worthington imports and smokes within the library. The paper also has a slight sheen to it, suggesting the presence of silken threads, which would also indicate an oriental origin. Sir Happy became very animated and in his enthusiasm said, You are as equal in intellect as you are in friendship. You have identified the origin correctly, Mommy. If you look on the original scrap of paper, you will notice tiny lettering written in pearlized ink, which is indicative of an oriental origin. Such markings are used almost exclusively in the production of printed materials associated with their luxury exports. You have a very keen nose, Mommy. The tobacco is strong enough to mask the scent of its owner, but I would be willing to speculate this tobacco paper belonged to a gentleman of considerable means, perhaps even the same gentleman observed by McGibbons before his untimely death. Hiram interrupted our exchange to ask, might you share your case for might you share your cause for excitement with the rest of us? I had forgotten, as had Sir Happy, that our human friends were unable to understand what we were saying, adding a challenging element to our sharing the information with them. How shall we explain this in a way he will understand? I asked, feeling a level of uncertainty in this entire arrangement. We shall just have to trust in the intellect of our friends and pray they are able to make intuitive leaps based upon the directions we give, he replied. I looked at him with a great deal of skepticism, to which he added, Mommy, this is not ideal, but we are faced with individuals who are most eager to bridge the gap of understanding through their willingness to listen. The least we can do is attempt to meet them halfway. He had a valid point, but I was still anxious to see how he would accomplish the communication. Sir Happy nosed the wad of paper over to Hiram and stared at the man, as though through such a penetrating glare he could convey the importance of the object. Hiram looked to the paper and then to Sir Happy obviously not understanding the request. Sir Happy sniffed the paper and then barked at Hiram, indicating his desire for the man to repeat the action. Hiram hesitated, trying to understand the directive, but uncertain of the correctness of his own actions. Again, Sir Happy sniffed the paper and barked. Ever so slowly, Hiram reached out, grabbed the paper, and smelled deeply. His eyes lit up as he detected the subtle fragrance of fine oriental tobacco. I smell smoking tobacco, he declared, to which Sir Happy began barking excitedly. Hiram had the clue, but now was the greater challenge of determining its significance. This time it was Charles who stepped up to the challenge. May I? he asked, extending his hand toward the spit-riddled paper. He very carefully spread it beneath his nose and inhaled deeply. To my surprise, he did as I had done and opened his mouth, as if to taste what he was smelling. 
This is no ordinary tobacco, nor is it wrapped in regular wood pulp paper. This aroma is from a high quality brand, smoked exclusively by men of good breeding who can afford such expensive luxuries. Sir Happy's twirls of excitement were so intense, I thought Sir Happy was going to fall off of the settee he shared with Hiram. <clears throat> You have obviously identified it correctly, based on Sir Happy's response. But how in the world did you know? Hiram asked of Charles. Charles replied, Many years before meeting Stephen, I worked for a time for a merchant of luxury items. I breathed such aromas for a great many months before being let go from my position due to slow sales. I will forever remember it lingering upon my clothes for many weeks after leaving my position. Now that we know what it is, said Hiram, the question remains to be answered of whether or not it is relevant. Hiram looked to Sir Happy for some hint as to the importance of the tobacco. It was my turn to offer the aid. Sir Happy, would you care to join me in a recreation of our hypothesis? My friend indicated he was willing to follow my lead. I led the way across the room so we were no longer next to our human friends, but now facing them. I shall be the gentleman, and you shall be the despicable fiend of a dog. Sir Happy narrowed his eyes at me, believing me to be in jest. I assured him of my honest sincerity in our play, leaving out the childlike glee I felt at being able to command my friend's performance. I explained my intent, and we set about carrying out our demonstration. I hid behind a footrest while Sir Happy took his position behind the matching chair. When all was set, I leaped out into the open and howled a command to attack, pointing my paw in Hiram's direction. Sir Happy enthusiastically jumped from his hiding place and raced over to the unsuspecting inspector, grabbing a tight hold on his pant leg. He gave it several shakes, accompanied by a series of vicious sounding growls to which Charles exclaimed, Good heavens! Sir Happy and I both returned to our original positions beside Hiram, hoping beyond all hope he would guess our imitation. Hiram's eyes widened as he began to think upon our actions. Are you suggesting a gentleman is behind these attacks and is actually commanding a dog to assault unsuspecting victims? He asked, almost in a whisper. Hurrah! cried Sir Happy as he be again began his twirling. Hiram looked almost pleased as he said, I shall take that as a yes. With as encouraging as the discovery was in illuminating what had been a dark and uncertain case for him, the entire matter still remained very troubling and brought with it a sobering effect. I looked to Charles, expecting him to be as excited about the discovery as the rest of us were, but his face lacked the requisite enthusiasm one might expect. His features were full of distress, and I was uncertain what it meant. Apparently, neither Hiram nor Sir Happy took notice of the change, focusing instead on the next piece of evidence on the table. Charles said nothing, but I continued to watch him as the investigative efforts proceeded. The next item brought forward for analysis was the shattered wooden cane. Since Stephen did not use a cane, I knew it had to belong to someone else. Not waiting for an invitation from Sir Happy, I moved forward to get a better look. There were traces of blood on the splintered end, as though the, the destruction had occurred during the process of a struggle, my guess being the struggle between Stephen and his assailant. But where the cane came from, and how it might have fallen into our injured friend's hands, were questions to which I had no answer. Sir Happy examined the cane more closely, noting the same traces of blood which I just mentioned. 
Upon sniffing the mangled end, he immediately began to growl in the deep and menacing way he did when confronted with the scent of something evil. I knew immediately, based on his reaction, the gore belonged not to Stephen, but to the beast itself, meaning our friend had injured the creature in some measure during the fray. Sir Happy's reaction gained the direct attention of Charles and Hiram, and <clears throat> the latter of the two immediately demanding, <clears throat> What is it, Sir Happy? Both men looked more closely at the fractured end of the cane, and in seeing the evidence of blood, Hiram observed it must belong to the attacker. I cannot imagine you reacting in such a way had it belonged to Stephen, so I assume it must be associated with the one we seek, to which Sir Happy barked his affirmation. Does Stephen use a cane when he is out and about? asked Hiram, turning to Charles. Never that I have seen. Charles replied, he has no need for one, and Stephen does not place much value in following the trends of men's fashions. Then where did he get the cane, and why was he carrying it with him? Hiram asked. We all looked to Sir Happy for answers. My friend stared off into the distance, lost in his contemplations. This new type of communication was a challenge to him, and as we all sat waiting upon his revelations, I knew Sir Happy was searching for ways to convey his thoughts and inspirations to his newly attentive human audience. Since that day, I have seen my friend become enormously creative in his mode of communication with our human counterparts, and it was th with great anticipation I awaited his next move. His head snapped up and his ears perked to attention as he suddenly recalled a source of information he might use to communicate his theory. His resource was a book of considerable size and was to be found on the top shelf of one of the library's many bookcases. The location of the tome made it problematic for Sir Happy to reach it, and so he was forced to beg for assistance in pulling it down and carrying it back to our work area. Charles was more than willing to aid in this endeavor, and within no time we were all peering over Sir Happy's shoulder as he nosed through the pages. The volume was a veritable encyclopedia on crime and punishment, with detailed information about the various sectors of London's underworld. Each area of criminal life was meticulously researched, the author having spent years interviewing both the criminal participants and their unsuspecting victims, I assume for the purpose of educating the public at large as to the dangers and moral pitfalls which lurked within the shadows of London's daily life. It was to the chapter on illegal sporting which Sir Happy turned, flipping determinedly to the section on dog fighting where an unbelievably violent series of illustrations showed the means of training a dog to fight. It was on one particular illustration that Sir Happy placed his paw and barked, drawing everyone's attention to the details of the drawing as well as to the identifying title beneath it. I shall not glorify the gore which was represented on the page beyond explaining in general terms, it was a depiction of a man with a rod of some sort, which was being used to force open the jaws of a brawny looking dog who had clamped down on the throat of a smaller opponent. The heading for the sketch read, Trainer uses pry bar to open Victor's jaw. It was evident from Sir Happy's clue, Stephen had used the cane to lever open the creature's mouth and in so doing had possibly injured the interior of the monster's oral cavity. If this were indeed the case, it was quite probable the dog was afflicted with the onset of infection due to embedded pieces of cane in the interior of its oral membrane. I revealed, I reveled at the idea of the beast's agony, unable to swallow without pain, unable to relieve its own suffering thanks to the lack of opposable thumbs. I imagined him 
pawing at his mouth in an attempt to dislodge the splinters, but to no avail. I looked upon the cane again, noting deep bite marks to one side of the mangled end. The cane had to have broken while Stephen was prying open his attacker's mouth. While I was savoring my morbid imaginings of great suffering on the part of the fiend, Hiram and Charles were coming to their own understanding of the illustration as it pertained to the case. <clears throat> I have seen Stephen use this method the few times we have had a large dog attack a smaller one here in the clinic, said Charles. It appears as though he had the wherewithal to apply the technique in the midst of his own struggle for life. I must say it took a great deal of quick wit to think of it under such circumstances. I mean, it would make sense to anticipate using the method in the clinic, where dogs from all walks of life are thrown in together, with only a few of them being properly socialized, but to prepare oneself for its application while walking the streets of London, it just boggles the mind as it becomes necessary. Hiram did not seem convinced Stephen's carrying of the cane was merely in response to the overwhelming number of dog attacks. I believe Stephen feared he would be attacked, which necessitate, necessitated his being prepared. He appears to have anticipated the killer's next move, but with dire results. I wish now he had given me more information in his letter, like a name or a location, somewhere to start from. I frankly have no idea where to go from here. Again, Sir Happy launched himself from the settee and bounded into the other room. It was not long before he returned carrying the letters Stephen had sent from the Pierpont residence. What's this? Hiram asked as Sir Happy dropped the bundle in his lap. Oh, those are the letters we received from Stephen when he was out of town. You know, come to think of it, they were very odd and had us all terribly concerned, Charles replied. Sir Happy stared expectantly at Hiram, tail wagging and body tense with anticipation, as our inspector friend opened the first of the three correspondences. I decided now was a good time to question my friend Sir Happy about the direction of his thoughts. Excuse me, Sir Happy, but would you mind explaining to me what the devil is going on? I feel as though you have run down the road of theories ahead of me, and I am unable to keep up. Without taking his eyes off of Hiram, he replied, It will all be made clear to you in a moment, my friend, but for now, let us not interrupt our friend here as he reads my Stephen's letter. I pray Hiram understands their importance. And so it was, I spent several agitated minutes waiting for Hiram's revelation, while I remained annoyed I did not have one of my own. As I watched our friend peruse through the mail, I detected the light of understanding begin to shine upon his face. By the time he reached the bottom of the third letter, he was positively beaming. Before anyone knew what he was intending, Hiram reached over and gave Sir Happy a brisk kiss on the forehead, to which my friend gave Hiram a reproachful look. Considering the important information Hiram had just received, one could understand his spontaneity. Forgive me, Sir Happy, Hiram said, for taking liberties, but I am overcome with excitement. To read these letters is like viewing a series of pictures which explain the entire situation surrounding Stephen's attack. I could not have hoped for a better declaration of the facts than this. Apparently, I was not the only one in the room who was lost to the significance of the Pierpont letters, for Charles immediately interrupted the gushing declaration of Hiram's understanding with for those of us who are not as quick-witted as the two of you, would you mind explaining how these correspondences help in the investigation? I was most relieved by his question, because it saved me from having to admit further I had no grasp of the letter's importance. Hiram replied, Don't you see, Charles? Stephen wrote me from the same location as these letters. The posts and the time frame are the same. 
he took care of several canines that appeared to have been mauled by another of their kind. All of the attacks here in London were committed by a canine. Somehow it is all connected, and Stephen found the key while he was at the Pierpont estate. See? Note here where he says something was terribly wrong with the servants, and most especially with the owners. His room was searched, and he became afraid for his safety while in the care of these people. Sir Happy has already established a gentleman is connected with these crimes, and based on the prestige of the Pierpont's name, I think we can safely assume this mysterious gentleman is a Pierpont, or is at least intimately connected with his family. Sir Happy began barking frantically, indicating our inspector friend had surmised correctly. Stephen had unwittingly stepped into the hands of the very fiend we thought. It was troubling to me to discover Stephen's compassion for creatures of all kinds was the very key to his undoing. He, had he refused the summons to the country, he would be safely here in his own home, with us still uncertain as to the identity of our devilish gentleman. What a price to pay for such a discovery. There seemed no justice in the matter. As I pondered these things, my eyes fell upon the small leather belt with its broken buckle. What I had failed to notice before was a small brass plate displaying a well-worn but unmistakable P on it. It was my turn to make a ruckus as I drew everyone's attention to this important clue. Could it be, Sir Happy, that instead of Horace hearing Mr. B, it was Mr. P? I asked. Might we have had the truth before us this entire time and missed it? Mr. P stands for Pierpont. I also reached for the handkerchief. Embroidered in the corner, most saturated in blood, was a stylized P. I looked to Sir Happy and said, Stephen took this from the Pierpont residence for a reason, old friend, and I do not believe it was because he anticipated using it as a tourniquet. I think he was bringing it to you for analysis. No dog in all of London has a nose like yours. Take a gander at the handkerchief and see if you can detect anything. Sir Happy smiled at me as he said, I am proud of you, old chap. Well done. I believe you have called it right about our Mr. P being a Pierpont, but we still have yet to determine which is which. We have no description of this Mr. P, and so we cannot conclusively determine if the intended blackmail victim was the older or the younger of the two. I do have my theories, however. In my mind, the answer was as clear and as obvious as the nose on my face, a point which I declared open to my friend. I think the key lies with the younger Pierpont, since our friend Horace described the gentleman seen observing Miss Penny's attack as being a relatively young man. It only makes sense the man behind the attacks would be the one to pay if he was caught up in a blackmailer's scheme. Sir Happy shook his head at me, saying, It is overly simplistic, Mommy. The elder Pierpont is still alive, meaning the pockets of the younger are not as deep, having yet to receive the inheritance due him upon the passing of his father. My guess is the elder Pierpont was the focus of the blackmail scheme. After all, the sins of the son would rest quite heavily upon the shoulders of the father. What do you think Lord Pierpont would pay to keep a scandal such as this from reaching the papers? Respectability is, after all, entirely about appearances. I had not thought about the peculiarities of high society and how its dynamic might affect the outcome of the entire case. I grant you a promising theory, Sir Happy. While I think about its magnitude, would you be so kind as to attend to the handkerchief? 
I had little time to expand my thoughts beyond what I have just expressed, because Sir Happy, upon sniffing the clean portion of the handkerchief, began growling in the same manner as when we were at Lexington Court. What is it? I asked. It is our gentleman from the McGibbons murder, Mommy, Sir Happy said. My Stephen has sold the case for us and has paid dearly for the knowledge. During the entirety of Sir Happy's and my exchange, Hiram and Charles sat patiently, waiting for some sign or signal from us as to what they should do next. Both in turn examined the leather collar, for it was indeed a collar ripped from the throat of Stephen's attacker. After I brought it to everyone's attention, and upon Sir Happy's response to the handkerchief, they each scrutinized the embroidered letter found upon the bloody corner. We have evidence now, said Hiram, which points directly to the Pierpont family being suspect, at least in Stephen's attack. Stephen gathered the evidence both from their estate and at his own crime scene. This leather collar proves the connection at least in my mind. The considerable challenge we now face is proving to an officer of the court that all of our discoveries are not just circumstantial. Since Stephen is unconscious and unable to testify to what we believe to be the truth, it will be all the more difficult for us to convince the proper authorities of the seriousness of the Pierpont connection. Surely you cannot be serious, exclaimed Charles, looking more exasperated than I had ever seen him before. The evidence is overwhelming, and we have Sir Happy's testimony at our disposal. He would never fabricate such a claim like this. I saw a slight grin go across Sir Happy's face as Charles made this proclamation. He leaned over towards me and whispered, and to think, just a short while ago, it was preposterous to think you and I were capable of rational thoughts. Now we have become expert witnesses. It's been a busy day for us. I hesitate to speak this in front of our friends, Hiram said, indicating towards Sir Happy and myself. I would hate to insult them with what I'm about to say, but it must be voiced. I cannot go before a justice and say my evidence has been identified for me by a dog and his feline associate. It is not that I am ashamed of this fact. It is quite simply I will not be believed. What credence will I have if I go before a justice and say Sir Happy told me one of the most prominent and well-respected families in the country is responsible for a series of brutal attacks? Sir Happy placed his paws upon Hiram's knee and stretched himself to his full length, so the two were nearly nose to nose. He said nothing, but just stood there, gazing into the eyes of his uncertain human friend. His black eyes were filled with an unmistakable intelligence and understanding, a point which could not be denied by the focus of his gaze. They remained so for some time until Hiram finally made a decision. I shall just have to risk it, Sir Happy, Hiram declared finally. They will either believe the truth or reject it. We shall present the evidence and give them the opportunity to see what we see here today. During the time of silent regard, Charles left the room, returning with a book from his personal library. When Hiram had concluded, he said, oh, I thought this might help put your mind at ease. Read this section on canine history, especially in regards to law enforcement. He handed the book to Hiram, who quickly found himself sharing the volume with my curious dachshund friend. Both of them seemed satisfied with the result of the pages. It says here, Mommy, began Sir Happy, hounds have been used for centuries to track lawbreakers and have been an integral part and have been an integral component in investigation. This passage offers justification for the assistance you and I have given. It proves the value we have in the investigative process. I do dispute the claim that bloodhounds have the most superior sense of smell, although it is perhaps a vanity on my part to make a challenge over such a misinformed opinion. 
we shall forever be underestimated by humans who unfortunately do not know any better. Ignorance should always inspire a compassion from us, Mommy. And I shall not fault the writers of this book because they are misinformed. It was decided upon. Hiram would immediately appeal to a justice for a warrant to search the Pierrepont estate and detain both the elder and younger Lord Pierreponts until such time as it could be determined which of the two were ultimately responsible for the attacks. Of course, Sir Happy and I had the testimony of Horace, proving the younger man was behind at least the attack on Miss Penny, but since we had no way at the moment of communicating it to Hiram or Charles, we had to be content there would be some damning evidence available to collect at the estate, assuming the justice would issue the warrant and permit the search. <clears throat> would you mind terribly if I borrowed these letters from Stephen to use as corroborating evidence when I present my findings to the court? Hiram asked. I think it will make our case when combined with the items found at the scene, as well as my own letter from Stephen indicating he had identified the killer. <clears throat> Hiram was, of course, given permission to take them, and he tucked them away safely inside his satchel, along with the other items he had brought. Hiram was just stepping out the door to leave when Amelia arrived with a tray full of delicate delights. Certainly you're not leaving just yet, she cried, almost buried behind the mountain of pastries. I am afraid I must make all haste and present my findings to a justice this very hour, Hiram said regretfully. It is my hope to obtain a warrant of search and arrest before the day is through. Perhaps another time, Miss Amelia. Sir Happy scratched at Hiram's leg and asked to be taken with him. It would be Sir Happy's first appearance before a member of the court, although not nearly his last. <clears throat> what is it, old boy? He asked Sir Happy. It was Charles who answered his inquiry by saying, I believe he is asking to go with you, to which Sir Happy barked repeatedly. Hiram hesitated for only a moment before answering, I suppose it would be appropriate under the circumstances. Besides, you might just be able to convince the judge of your keen intellect and your finely honed skills of observation. I know now my friend was thrilled at the opportunity to see the law in action, being a great admirer and an ardent student of the legal system. It was Charles's turn to ask to attend. It was not merely curiosity which draws me to ask if I might accompany you. When it was revealed the mastermind behind Stephen's attack was a gentleman, I was filled with a sense of dread surrounding his encounter with the Pierponts. My insides told me the family was connected somehow, and well, I would like to see this through to the end, if it would not be too much trouble. Hiram smiled and said, of course you would be welcome to join us. Besides, you are an expert witness in the matter of canine anatomy and physiology. You might offer some insight into the entire situation if the justice has a question in that regard. Amelia squealed at the thought of everyone leaving her, especially considering the tremendous amount of food which now presented itself to the group. What am I to do with all of this food? she asked. I'm sure it will keep, dearest, replied Charles, who was now anxious to be about their business. Sir Happy had already stepped out the door and was waiting at the foot of the front steps for Charles and Hiram to join him. But, Amelia started, but trailed off, knowing any arguments she might offer would be fruitless at best. She knew once her husband set his mind to something, there was little which might be said to persuade him otherwise. And, of course, Sir Happy was as stubborn and as obstinate as the worst of them, and was already halfway to the courthouse, at least in his heart and mind. I, for one, was focused on the scrumptious food which had been so lovingly prepared. I certainly did not want Amelia to feel as though her efforts were in vain, so I rubbed my face against her leg to let her know I was staying with her. Thank you, Mr. Mommy, 
she said. I'm glad someone appreciates my efforts. Sir Happy ran back up the stairs momentarily to try and persuade me to come along with the rest of them. Come on, Mommy, old boy. This might be of interest to you. I yawned deeply and with a great sigh, as though I was preparing myself for a terrible hardship, and said, Thank you, old friend, but I think there is enough support in this matter between the three of you. Besides, someone must stay here and keep a watch over Amelia. She has, after all, gone through a very harrowing ordeal as of late. My friend smiled as he said, You are staying for the food, aren't you? <laughs> I hesitated for a moment, debating whether or not denial would accomplish anything in this situation. Upon careful consideration, I felt honesty would be the best avenue. Yes, it is the food. I shall tell you all about it when we return. But mind this, Mommy, Sir Happy said. If we find the justice amenable to our request, there is not a kip of snack in all of London which will keep you here. I shall make sure of it. Sir Happy turned and was out the door and down the stairs, leading the way to the courthouse. I did my best to eat the lion's share of food, and from the way Amelia was stuffing the sweet morsels into her mouth, her intentions were pretty much the same. I believe my presence offered her some measure of comfort, and so we spent the better part of the afternoon eating our weight in pastry and tea. I took a hearty nap afterwards, knowing full well I would have little rest soon enough and would be positively craving it, with no hope of receiving any. Something deep within my heart told me the justice would approve Hiram's request for a warrant, which would mean only a small window of opportunity to catch the culprits unaware. Sometimes I hate being right.